Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel Johnson. I'm an Associate Director at CoStar Group. I'm here leading a panel on moving forward in New York City real estate post COVID-19. I'm gonna start out introducing our panelists and then take you through some questions. So I'll start off with Eileen. Could you please introduce yourself? Um, Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Eileen O'Toole. I'm a landlord tenant attorney and do rent regulation work also. And um, I'm doing a webinar actually at this expo tomorrow on HSTPA and changes um, that have happened since then. And I've also written a book about rent regulation and the uh, this year's annual edition will be coming out, um, I think next week. Great, thank you. Uh, Janelle Simmons, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Janelle Simmons. I'm the CEO of Landlords New York, which is a virtual trade organization for landlords and property managers here in New York. Great, uh, James Watt at Lee & Associates. Could you yes, hi, I'm Jim Watt. I'm the president of Lee & Associates. We are a commercial brokerage company here in New York. Uh, we manage through our affiliate, Tri-Hill Associates, over 250 uh, properties in the city. Uh, we also have 60 brokers that specialize in uh, commercial brokerage, including landlord representation, tenant representation. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of retail leasing and investment sales, and we're also developers. So we have our finger in a lot of different pies. Great. Uh, Paul Massey, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hey, Rachel. Um, Paul Massey, CEO of uh, B6 Real Estate Advisors. We are a uh, building sales and uh, debt brokerage firm active in the five boroughs. Great. And we have two people here from CHIP, Michael Johnson. Could you give yourself a little introduction? Sure. I'm the communications director at CHIP. Uh, before starting to work here, I was the editor of City and State Magazine. Before that, I was the executive producer of Capital Tonight, which is kind of the upstate version of uh, Inside City Hall. Um, so I have a experience in media and, and been doing a lot of surveys and data collection for CHIP in the last uh, year. Cool. Could you explain a little what CHIP is for those who don't know? Sure. I was going to let Jay do that, actually, because that's okay. that's what he does every time. So I don't want to see <laughs> Um, positive to Jay. Could you give us yeah. a little intro? Well, I have the privilege of being Michael's colleague, uh, but uh, <laughs> for uh, CHIP, uh, I'm the executive, my, Jay Martin, I'm the executive director of CHIP, the Community Housing Improvement Program. We are uh, an organization that represents uh, primarily property owners in the rent stabilized universe, about 4,000 property owners. Um, we also represent uh, folks on both sides of the spectrum, brokers, et cetera. Um, and my background, I come from uh, a little over 12 years in the New York State Senate. So it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, we all know that the New York City real estate market has changed dramatically in the past 12 months. Um, the way we live, work and play is completely different to how it was 12 months ago. So James, what have we learned in the past 12 months? Well, we've learned quite a few lessons. We did learn, <laughs> unfortunately, that black swans do exist. Uh, obviously, COVID was a black swan event that nobody anticipated and took, I think, many of us by surprise. Uh, we've also learned, you know, how significant government is, um, you know, both at the federal, state and local level. Uh, we saw at the federal level how a complete lack of leadership really caused this crisis to spin out of control. Um, we're also seeing right now how government is trying to respond to it and whether or not it's gonna be good or bad for the real estate industry in New York uh, remains to be seen. Uh, you know, the Senate just passed a, a whole slew or, or the legislature just passed a whole slew of bills increasing uh, taxes throughout the city. So it's one way they're responding to it. We're gonna see how that impacts our business. Uh, we've also seen, I mean, particularly if you pay attention to the stock market over the last couple of weeks, is that optimism and pessim pessimism really affects the markets. And hopefully what we're seeing right now is a new wave of optimism uh, that's affecting New York. People are getting vaccinated. People are feeling more comfortable about uh, coming back into the city. The weather certainly helps. I mean, we're having beautiful weather right now. You walk through Central Park, you see the cherry blossoms. All of this is lifting our spirits. And I'm hoping that by lifting our spirits, we're going to start getting back to normalcy. 
Uh, you know, it's really critical that people start coming back to Midtown and occupying office space and visiting their local retailers. Um, we've also discovered how important it is to have lines of communication within our office to talk to people uh, who we work with. Plus, in our case, since we have so many tenants uh, that we deal with, that we start to communicate with tenants and not treat every tenant the same, but under, have to sit down and learn the issues that are affecting our tenants and to address them. So we spent probably the last uh, the first six months of COVID really sitting down with a lot of our office and retail tenants and, and working through their issues to make sure they stayed in business. What we did not want to see was a wholesale abandonment of space by our tenants. So we did whatever we could do to keep our tenants in business. Uh, and those are really the lessons that we learned over the last year. Thanks. It's definitely a lot of knowledge that we have all taken on in this year. Um, and speaking of legislation, I mean, what... Uh, what is the status of the eviction moratorium in New York City? That's actually a question that for those of us who work in this field comes up at least once a week because things <laughs> have been continuing to evolve. And what I'll say before I um, say anything about the specifics is if you are someone who is following this, one good place to look at the beginning of every week is the court system's website. And I will just quickly give you the site for that. It's www.courts.state.ny.us. Um, Judge Fiore does a weekly talk on Monday morning saying what's going on and they have um, separate web pages on that site for both the commercial and residential eviction moratoriums. There, there are three laws that I've been following. And one is the, um, the federal eviction moratorium that the CDC has promulgated. And that now, right now, that has been extended to June 30th of 2021. What that means for people in New York is a little unclear to me at the moment. The CDC federal moratorium doesn't apply if you have better or more um, protections as a tenant under the state eviction moratorium. So right now, but for the fact that the state moratoriums in New York are ending on May 1st, um, they have, I think, a, some more protections for tenants than the CDC moratorium does, except that now that one's going longer. Whether New York is going to follow suit remains to be seen. There's still several weeks until May 1st. So I think we need to keep an eye on what's going to happen with that. In New York, we have two separate sets of laws for residential and for commercial tenants um, with eviction moratoriums. And the current law for the residential tenants is what um, we call the CEE, CEEFPA, that's the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Act. And what, what's involved with that, there is an eviction moratorium until May 1st there is generally for the housing courts, um, you know, evictions are not happening. There's no default judgments being taken. And if you're going to start a new proceeding, which a lot of people aren't doing right now for non-payment because it's not really going to go anywhere in housing court, what um, the tenants need to do is file a hardship declaration form. But the law as it's set up, and this law went into effect in December, the law requires owners with every notice you send the tenant, you know, you have the rent reminder notice now before you have a rent demand, before you have a petition. With each of those, the owner is supposed to serve on the tenant the hardship declaration form. And you have to make three attempts. So you have to get a process server involved in doing this. And if you don't do that, that'll I'm sure give tenants more defenses once you get started in court. Um, the separately in March, the state passed what is called COVID-19 Emergency Protect Our Small Businesses Act, which is giving commercial tenants and um, a hardship declaration form that, that they can file. Now, the thing is that the that law was put into effect for 60 days since March 9th. So I know some practitioners think there's not much sense in commercial tenants filing the hardship declaration form right now because the eviction moratorium right now that's ending May 1st will happen before anything can happen otherwise anyway. But um, you know, if people have any questions about that, they should ask their attorneys. 
Great, thanks. Um, Janelle, you have a very unique perspective given your role at Landlords New York. Um, what are landlords doing who rely on rent payments uh, to pay their mortgage taxes and maintenance doing at the moment? Are there resources to assist these landlords? Um, great question. And because of my position at Landlords New York, we one of the aspects of our site is a forum where our 6,500 plus landlords and property manager members are able to communicate. And that is the, the number one question that we see asked. I know it was mentioned a moment ago, once weekly, I, I would agree to one of the comments that hourly or daily, um, you know, with so many tenants unable to, to pay their rents during the pandemic, lawmakers passed these sweeping blanket moratoriums. But these laws and executive orders really provided little to no relief for landlords who still have to pay to keep their building operating. So tenants who signed the, the document that Eileen mentioned uh, that they've experienced a COVID-related hardship, essentially can, these protections have continued to be extended. So the law offers, a, again, little to no, we'll say minimal relief for landlords. Um, it does prevent lenders from foreclosing on property owners, I believe, with 10 units or fewer uh, before May 1st if they've experienced a COVID-related hardship. Uh, but they're still responsible for the mortgage, the taxes, water, and heating bills, of course. So it's been an incredibly difficult time for, for landlords and for property owners right now. Um, what most are, are doing, what's been recommended is to try to negotiate with your tenants some sort of payment plan because this legislation uh, delays evictions, but it doesn't erase the back rent. So you could still bring a case against your tenants uh, for the unpaid rent that could hurt their credit. So, you know, some litigators uh, that I've spoken with have recommended, suggested that they you use that as some sort of negotiating tool to try to work out an agreement uh, with your tenants with you privately so that they can avoid, avoid court, protect their credit. Um, you know, if they've lost wages and are unable to pay, offer information about unemployment assistance or other benefits of benefits that are available. You know, unfortunately, we've continued to see more and more resources and protections in place for tenants, which I shouldn't say unfortunately, it's fortunate because everyone um, has been affected throughout this, but landlords have really been um, forced to kind of shoulder the brunt of it. And with with no, uh, you know, with no money coming in and no recourse to collect those rents, it just becomes increasingly difficult. So perhaps they could pay a reduced rent in exchange for waiving some of that past debt, uh, providing you with some income and with some financial relief. And you could offer, or you could offer to pay them to vacate. Of course, they may not be in a position to, to move or to even want to move during a pandemic. Um, but, you know, those are, aside from that, we'll just continue to have to, to wait and see. As Eileen mentioned, May 1st is, you know, at the, current, the most current deadline that hopefully um, is going to be the end of this. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to just watch and see if any future bills or assistance is going to be passed to help owners continue to weather this storm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people in agreement here. I can see in the comments that landlords are screaming <laughs> for help. And uh, that's daily a view that is reflected across New York. Um, okay, so we'll move on to Paul. Uh, when do you think New York City will return to normal and is a full recovery possible for the market? We, um, we had a, uh, a historian come and speak to our sales force uh, because we were trying to spruce up or, or make more lively our sales meetings on these Zoom calls, which I, I think are, are getting dry. Um, and this historian, um, gave a talk to our team about the fact that there has been a pandemic in every century in New York, um, but people don't realize it. In the 1600s, there was cholera. In the 1700s, there was typhoid. In 1918, we had the Spanish flu. And he said, in each case, the pandemics were massively harmful to the city and people fled the city for a year or two. And, um, but in each case, afterwards when the pandemic was over people came flooding back into the city and business boomed and uh cultural institutions uh flourished bars and restaurants were packed i think we're going to see 
a moment of euphoria. And, you know, after the Spanish flu in 1918, there was um, the roaring 20s. That was Manhattan right after that pandemic. And so I am really optimistic about what's going to happen here. I think you're starting to feel it a little bit, but I would think there's going to be radical change for the better, um, probably in early uh, June, um, certainly going into the summer where people are uh, going to be largely vaccinated and um, wanting to get back here. Great. Uh, do you think that the long-term trend of working from home will continue and will that affect New York's office market? I think the work, I, a lot of people debate me on this. I think work from home is a complete <laughs> fad. I, I think it's going to evaporate uh, very, very quickly. I, you know, look, there are certain folks who, um, who it's appropriate that they can work from home um, where they're, 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 not having as much interaction with with their associates but i think largely uh people need to be at work people need to have the interaction have the casual interaction that happens all, all day and I, so i think uh a year from now the work from home concept will be a memory that's interesting um i think we i'm definitely hearing some differing opinions on whether we'll all be going back into the office every day or doing a split model. But thank you for that insight. I know that my wife is hoping that the work from home model disappears as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and all the people with multiple children under age 10 who can't get- Yeah, and the, and the, and the, de and the, and the debate goes on about, you know, are we going to be uh, needing more space, less space? Uh, you know, I, I noticed uh, uh, the CEO of Morgan Stanley when the pandemic hit started immediately talking about radically downsizing their real estate footprint and now he's reversing himself. Uh, I, I think, you know, people are wondering, well, if there's anybody who is gonna end up in the work from home category, is that gonna lessen the need for space? I think there was a densification going on that was too much. So I think mm -hmm. when people start looking at their space with an eye for, you know, th this is not going to be the last pandemic. So we've got to, we're probably going to set up a safer workspace for ourselves. That's going to require more space. So I think any downsizing will be offset by people setting up space where we're not cheek to jowl. And, um, and I could see companies taking uh, additional space to, um, uh, compensate for a safer work environment. Great. Uh, switching back over to uh, residential. Um, Jay, could you tell me, is the apartment vacancy rate really above 5% in New York? Uh, yes, Rachel, thank you for that. Uh, by the <laughs> way, we, we believe it is. Um, <laughs> believe it is. Uh, certainly in some sections of this, of this city, it absolutely is above Five um, percent, and obviously we know the impact that that might have on current rules and regulations. But we know uh, the, the the deck is stacked against us in the political environment that the uh, elected officials that we work with will figure out a way to keep rent stabilization in place, regardless of whether or not we're over that five percent threshold. So it's an argument that we have to keep making, and, and the conversation we need to keep having. Uh, but I see several comments of folks talking about. Uh, I want to just go back to the eviction moratorium briefly in the time that I have to talk a little bit about uh, where we are um, and what we've seen on the ground as far as the impact on, on residential. Um, so where we sit right now is April 7th, right? And, and the eviction moratorium on residential properties in New York is supposed to expire on May 1st. The uh, housing chair in the New York State Legislature has already said that um, as, as early as two days ago when they were passing the emergency rental assistance program, which was $2 billion of federal funding to go directly to renters to assist in paying back rent arrears, which will ultimately go back to our membership to pay back owed rental debt, um, that he believes there is a fundamental health uh, need to extend the eviction moratorium past May 1st. At the same time he is saying this, the deputy majority lead, leader of the state Senate is talking about actually begging the Major League Baseball to bring the All-Star game to Queens. And um, we're also seeing uh, elected officials begging um, 
for schools to open up. And we're seeing, uh, as James and Paul talked about, we're seeing commercial uh, leasing um, come back anew. And we're seeing residential leasing come back a little bit. So the question is, if it's really for health reasons, how are elected officials on one hand talking about opening up our tourism industry, opening up our restaurants, opening up uh, uh, you know, different avenues of tourism, and yet we're also talking about keeping the courts closed for due process rights that are for both renters and property owners. So there's a real problem happening here. So uh, you know, one thing I will just urge everyone who's on the call that we are going to have to let our elected officials know over the next three to four weeks that you know, both on the commercial side and the residential side, we are not in the business of evictions. We are in the business of providing commercial property for folks to rent and create small businesses or large businesses to have a, a footprint here in the in the greatest city in the world to run their businesses, or we're, we're in the business of providing housing, affordable, safe housing for them to live here. We're not in the business of removing people from housing. Evictions are our only process in which to extract payment, frankly. It's our only recourse. Um, if there was a better model other than housing court, we would approve, we would we would go through a better model, but that is the only model that we have currently. So the courts need to open up for the for the safe, uh, for the future of our city, for the future of new lease signings on the commercial side, for the future of lease signings on the residential side. Who is going to enter a legal agreement if they know that the recourse that they have in the court system, it remains closed? If I'm a commercial tenant or if I'm a future residential tenant, um, and if I'm going to be signing leases and the court system remains closed, why would I enter into a long-term legal agreement if the only recourse I have to adjudicate that process is in a court system that remains closed? So that's something that I think as an industry, we need to make sure our lawmakers know that the future recovery of the city will not actually ever achieve its true potential until we open up the court system in a way that it provides due process rights to both renters and for our uh, commercial uh, leases, leasers, and our residential leases. But I just, that, just my comment on the residential side, it's something we're gonna have to, because they are absolutely pushing to extend the eviction moratorium past May 1st. Uh, some are talking about extending it another six months past May 1st. So it's something that I think we need to really be cognizant of um, that will keep ha hampering the, the, the uh, recovery that we, we see going forward. Yeah, that seems to be a very, large dichotomy between the recovery that seems to be on the horizon in the political world and extending the eviction moratorium. Um, so Chip, what do you think is the most important thing for the recovery of the New York City housing market? I'll fill that one since you just spoke. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think yeah. honestly, the recovery of the city is, t is tied to the recovery of the, the market, right? So what, what we've been doing is disturbing our members every single month on vacancy rates and, and also on people paying rent. So what we've found, and, and I think our December survey was the best that kind of pointed this, is that you know, there was a declining operating income about 22% for the rent-stabilized building owners, which is you know, roughly $3.5 billion. Um, but the rent arrears are only about $1 to 1.1 billion of that, right? So the, the biggest problem is vacancies. And if you look at the rent stabilized markets, about 40% of the apartments in New York City, um, you know, about half of those are, are at market rate. And the vacancies are really high in those, in those um, apartments at this point because so many people fled Manhattan. We need those people to come back because that's like the, that's a $2.5 billion problem versus the $1 billion problem of people not paying the rent. Um, so I, mean, I think that's the biggest kind of concern that we're looking at. And until the city starts to come back, um, I think that you know you're you're going to have people wanting to come back and move in. Um, you're going to have this, you know, essentially lots of buildings operating in the red. I think a lot of lawmakers also don't really realize this yet. So you know, we we read our numbers from our surveys against the Rent Guidelines Board's reports, and we calculated that in 2020. Um, the average kind of profit per unit per month was about $77 um, before you collect income or before you pay your mortgage. So basically, you know, th these are buildings that are underwater. Um, even with the $1 billion that we're getting in theory from federal rent relief, and that's probably overestimating how much would go to the rent stabilized building owners, that would even jump it up to like $173 per month and that's compared to, you know, obviously before you're collecting your own income and before you're um, paying your mortgage. 
So, th so there's a there's just a, an economic gap right there that needs to get solved. And the only way you can really solve that type of loss um, is to, is to basically have people coming back and starting to rent. And then also, you know, in in addition to the vacancy rate being so high, which we've we've asked our members every single month since I think July, and it's been above ten percent. And you know, again, this is people who are you know mostly operating rent stabilized units. You know, and again, they're seeing this big gap of of drop off on on the half of their properties that are um, or half of their units that are market rate. So what's what's if we don't if we don't solve that problem if the city doesn't come back if businesses don't open up again you know they're going to have another year where people are basically operating underwater. Great. Um, we'll move on to the next question I have to you for you for here. Um, so how do we get some of these vacant units rented again? Um, so Michael, yeah, I'll take that and at the risk of this becoming a back and forth between us because we we bother each other enough when we work together, but I'll, I'll, I'll be brief with this. Basically, you know, the HSTPA and many of you in the uh, participants and many of you on this panel know the the major impact the 2019 rent laws had to across the, the real estate sector, but especially in the rent stabilized market and how it drastically changed. Um, the operating model and and to one person's question in the chat uh, drastically reduce the the value of long term rent stabilized property holders and one of the reasons why it reduced the value is the ability to increase rents on vacancies and the their the rationale behind the law uh, and the change of that law was the this idea that that rents are being increased by the rents by by the lack by property owners basically getting together, being in a, in a giant cohort and deciding to increase rents on everyone. Well, we would argue that the rent stabilization system in and of itself actually limits the supply um, and actually reduces the ability of new housing. And we've seen it just as early as yesterday when there is affordable housing, mixed use development uh, of residential properties being discussed in lower Manhattan and the, uh, the no in my backyard groups are fighting that development in a, in a dichotomy between preserving parking lot space over the development of new residential housing and some with with uh, below market affordable housing development in it at the sake for the sake of preserving a parking lot space well that kind of dichotomy there that thinking has led us to a place where we have no uh, new housing development this city needs to produce at least 20 to 30 thousand new units of housing a month for the next four years to be able to meet the demand of influx of new residential uh, folks moving into the city. So what do we need to do? Well, all these vacant units that are coming off of long-term tenancy, we need the ability to renovate them. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, when I talk to lawmakers and many of you who have operated in this in this space before have uh, know what it's like when you get a long-term tenancy, they don't understand that how a, how a unit um, of housing could need uh, $100,000 worth of renovation, how it could need a gut renovation, how it could need abatement. Many of you know that when you're working with a tenant who's been in place for 20 or 30 years in a long-term rent stabilized property, the, the long-term impact of a long-term tenancy means that there's exponentially more renovation work that needs to be done. The longer that person is in that long-term tenancy, rent stabilization encourages long-term tenancy. It also encourages rents to be kept below market. So what you happen when you have a pandemic, when the pandemic encourages vacancies, and we saw vacancies in rent stabilized properties, the likes of which we had never seen historically. To James's point, it was a black swan event. Uh, people were giving up rent stabilized leases in, in, a, in a way that nobody had ever done before. And so what you have is we had a market flooded with older units that need drastic renovations because of COVID, then you have HSTPA on top of that, which reduces the owner's ability or eliminates the owner's ability to increase the rent on the vacant unit. So what do you have? You have a dearth or you have a, a plethora of units that are below market that need huge renovations that the owner will never be able to, to renovate at the cost uh, to rent. So they're losing money on a vacant unit. They will lose even more money on a unit that's rented at that cost without renovation. So we believe and we're going to be proposing, uh, working with Senator Kavanaugh, hopefully, an ability for owners to just increase rents on vacant units, so we're not increasing rents on any current tenants, on vacant units to the HUD fair market rent at a, as a baseline value. 
on those units that are completely vacant and that are below current market rents for the, those markets to give owners the ability to at least borrow or lend to themselves on renovations for those units because we have to be able to get, bring those units back into the market. We have a housing uh, vacancy. Um, we have a huge problem with, with uh, a need of housing and those units are currently locked in purgatory because they're below market and they need renovations. You know, Jay, um, a, a big picture concern that we have is that um, the rent regulations have severely limited or killed the net income of, you know, tens of thousands of buildings. And uh, what I don't think the legislature considered was the fact that the city, the city of New York's budget, which is about $93 billion, um, half of which is derived directly from the real estate tax um, on commercial buildings. So if you put in place uh, legislation that's designed and we, we have empathy for lower income New Yorkers and folks who struggle and, um, and we, sh we should be working on creating more housing for them. Um, but if you're you know, severely diminishing your tax base, um, you can't tax nothing. So I think the city is going to be likely facing tens, potentially tens of billions of dollars of, of budget shortfalls over the next few years. Um, and the city doesn't have variability in that budget to the extent that you would think. There are bond payments. Um, there are retiree payments. There, there, there are a lot of fixed payments that the city has. So what we're concerned about is um, the first thing that's going to be sacrificed uh, are social programs designed to help the very people that the legislature thought they were trying to help. So the whole thing is is very backwards to me. And um, and you know the city's got uh, facing budget shortfalls um, from COVID to begin with, and this just you know piles it on. Deep, deep it's deeply concerning. Mm -hmm. Um, Eileen, I know you are intimately familiar with the HSTPA legislation um, from 2019 to now. Could you describe uh, how the legislation has affected the market uh, prior to the pandemic through 2020 and looking ahead? Okay, well, um, the market, I mean, Jay has mentioned, you know, one of the big concerns in terms of vacancies and how to uh, re-rent those units. Um, I was a little surprised that during this pandemic year, while we were all kind of walking through amber, there actually was more, there were more things happening. There were more um, litigations and fighting over certain provisions of the HSTPA, and some of them have been modified. And, you know, the big tree that fell in the forest last year was the Regina decision. Um, one of the big problems for owners that the HSTPA created was that it, it increased this, um, made a bigger, longer statute of limitations period and liability for rent overcharges. And DHCR to begin with had many, many rent overcharge cases that it seemed to be taking them years to get through. So now all of a sudden under HSTPA, you had pending cases that you know, that may have been answered two years before HSTPA, still sitting with DHCR, then DHCR turns around and says, okay, now you have to send us six years worth of rent history instead of four years. And then while they're sitting on those or reversing decisions in administrative appeals, the, um, the, the issue was also working its way up through the courts pretty quickly. And you have Regina Metropolitan Co. versus DHCR that came out in April that said, no, you can't do that. It's, it denies due process to owners. It's not fair to apply this retroactively. So, um, you know, the courts and DHCR, once it got back into operation after a few months of being shut down, have been starting to process these cases. And, you know, to the extent that, um, non-payment of rent is, is an issue for, for owners and for tenants who may have employment and, and COVID health issues going on. Um, I would think that, you know, what comes out of these overcharge cases 
is important to both owners and um, you know and the tenants who may be looking through additional relief through an overcharge finding. Um, there are starting to be decisions that are working out how the calculations are, are being applied. I'll be talking about a lot of this stuff more tomorrow in the um, webinar on HSTPA. The other um, things that have happened are more procedural, the processing of applications for major capital improvement rent increases. There is now a reasonable cost schedule that HSTPA told DHCR to put into effect that's now in effect. There is a reporting and recording system for individual apartment systems built into the rent registration now. There's just more and more um, regulation. One of the things that has not happened is that the HSTPA directed DHCR to um, do regulations to go with the law by June 2020. That still has not happened so far. And one of the things um, Jay touched on in a way is that HSTPA also has codified an owner's duty to mitigate damages if, um, if a tenant breaks a lease. And previously the case law went different ways. It would change every few years. It would be different in Brooklyn than it would be in Manhattan about what the owner had to do. And um, I know that you know owners and tenants and a lot of attorneys like myself who work in this field spent a fair amount of time in the first few months of the pandemic doing workout agreements uh, in instances where tenants did want to break their leases, some of them unregulated tenants, some of them regulated tenants. Uh, and you know each case was a little different. There would be different things that uh, each side would be able to leverage, you know, if the tenant had a, a lot of arrears, that might have been worked into the agreement. If the tenant had a rent overcharge complaint, resolving that often got worked into the agreement, or if there were other, um, you know, the landlord had punched a hole in the wall um, doing renovations after COVID began, um, that might have gotten worked into the, the agreement, but that stuff seems to have tapered off now, um, you know, since I think most of those, those issues were resolved. So those are, those are the, some of the things that I've seen happening. Just some, <laughs> quite <Right>. a lot. <laughs> uh, so Janelle, could you let us know uh, how landlords have been changing their practices uh, over the past year and what the biggest challenges and concerns are for them right now? Yeah, I think some of uh, my fellow panelists have absolutely hit the nail on the head in terms of vacancies and arrears. Um, you know, that's, that's the number one uh, concern. And Jay is absolutely right in terms of these apartments that need renovations. There's work that needs to be done on buildings, but without the income, where is that money coming from for these upgrades is the biggest concern that I that I see in here among our membership. Um, it's not like you can lay off staff because in a lot of cases, you actually need additional staff to keep up with uh, additional cleaning and disinfection and sanitation. You know, when I look back to a year ago when this first began, it wasn't, you know, the initial concern wasn't, uh, we got to collect money, we got to evict these tenants. It was, how are we going to protect our buildings and protect our tenants? Because this was all so new and no one knew where to go for direction. So it was, cleanings were ramped up, sanitation and the buildings were ramped up. And then in the instances where you have tenants who um, became sick, how do you deal from a building communication perspective, from a legal perspective with communicating with that tenant with other residents with protecting their health, um, you know, things you don't think about like double bagging your trash and setting it outside at certain times for the supers to collect. I mean, there was just so many things that I think we don't think about until you're thrown into the middle of this situation. So, um, you know, right now there, you know, with, with the lack of, of revenue is obviously the biggest concern. So when you have upgrades and renovations that need to to happen, um, you're absolutely looking to to negotiate those deals. And of course, price shopping and rate shopping, we actually created a buyer's group during the pandemic for our members just to help um, to help facilitate some business between uh, between landlords and vendors who are both struggling. Um, with with the vacancies, uh, you're seeing a lot of concessions 
So for, you know, for tenants who are looking for an apartment, they're loving it because a lot of times you're seeing two, three months in some instances, concessions that we haven't seen or needed to offer before. Uh, additional, you know, with some of the limitations from the Tenant Protection Act put on uh, tenant screening and things of that nature, you know, you have to be, of course, cautious and mindful, but we are in a time with an eviction moratorium that, you know, collecting rents and, and a tenant's ability to to pay is, is certainly a top of mind issue and concern. So, you know, I think um, I think the revenue is is as we as we've discussed across the board. You know, just a number <laughs> number one concern of vacancies. But hopefully, we're nearing the end of that. And as the city continues to get vaccinated, you know, we hope that um, that we'll see more and more of our tenants return to New York. Right. Um, thank you. So. We have uh, New York City local elections coming up. It's going to be a very important one. Uh, James, what are the critical issues that the newly elected leaders need to address? If you hear a lot of banging in the background, they're doing local law 11 work on my building and right now they're right outside my apartment. Um, so uh, it, it's a great topic. I mean, this is singularly, I think the most important local election uh, that we've seen in this city, at least in the last 20 or 30 years and what we're talking about is not just for the mayor we're talking about city council you're talking about borough presidents you're talking about control you're talking about district attorney all of this is going to have a profound impact on the future of our city and quite frankly if there's one message all of you should be taking away from this symposium today is you all have to get actively involved in this election campaign and you need to start paying attention to who the candidates are and you have to start supporting them and you have to start making donations. And by the way, the city has a very generous um, program where for every dollar you donate to a local candidate, assuming they qualify, they get $8 in city money, campaign money. So if you write a check just for $100, that's really $900 in contribution to candidates. So really you have to start paying attention to it. So let's talk about what the real issues are for these candidates. First of all, COVID obviously is an issue, but hopefully that's we're going to see that in the rearview mirror shortly. Public safety, uh, I think people right now are feeling um, uncomfortable in the city. I know a number of my employees uh, do not want to return to the city right now because they feel the city has become unsafe. Um, the murder rate in New York City over the last year has more than doubled. Every day we read about shootings that are going on in, in, all over the city, uh, and it's scary. And so that's an issue that has to be addressed. Um, we have a police department right now that's been, I think, hand-strung hand or whatever the expression is by, uh, by our local politicians, which is making it increasingly more difficult for our police to do what, they're, what their job happens to be. And the police are actually charged with doing a lot of things that I don't think police officers should be doing. The police really need to start focusing on, on the real crimes that are occurring in the city. So that's one very important issue. Related to that is homelessness. I mean, homelessness adds to the, to the crime statistics. Uh, it's a serious issue when you're walking around the city of New York and you see a homeless person in every corner. Not only does it really tug at your heartstrings that you feel terrible for these people, but you also realize it creates an image for the city that the city isn't safe. So that's an issue that absolutely has to be addressed. And it's not, you know, when you talk about homelessness, what you're really talking about is a mental health issue. Uh, and that definitely has to be addressed. And it has to be addressed not just at a local level, not just at the city level, but also at the state level. Because what the state is doing is dumping people out of the prison system into the city of New York with no support. And it's not a surprise that many of these people who are being released from prison now wind up being homeless. Um, affordable housing is a huge issue right now. Um, and when Paul was talking about the city returning back to normal, uh, one thing that has happened, I think, in the last couple of years, and this is not just COVID related because it started happening before COVID, the city started losing population. And the city was losing population at a rate of about 100,000 people per year. It's a horrible trend for this city to go, be going through. And why is that? The cost of living in a city um, for somebody who's middle class and lower middle class has become extremely expensive. Finding housing that they can afford has become very difficult. And the other thing is, is New York City, it's a great city, but there are other cities that are now competing with New York. There's cities like Salt Lake City, Denver, uh, Austin, um, many other cities that are now becoming appealing to the younger generation. And as we all know, capital follows 
um, talent. And if the talent is no longer coming to New York and is going to these secondary cities because they can't afford to be here, that's a terrible trend for New York City. So affordable housing, and it's not just affordable housing for the poor, it's also affordable housing for the working class. And this all relates to the rent regulations and everything else. We have to look at this from 30,000 square feet and say to ourselves, what can we do to change public policy here to encourage housing that allow young professionals to live in the city at an affordable level and not leave the city once they start breeding and having children. Uh, and the last thing is coming up economic policies that, that, that encourage job and wage growth. Uh, what I fear right now, uh, when I look at the slate of candidates that are running at various offices, is they're more concerned with social legislation than they are with economic growth in the city. And we can't have policies that are going to discourage economic growth in the city. The Amazon fiasco was a disaster for the city. Uh, Industry City, the rezoning down there, was also a disaster for the city. We have to have politicians who understand that we have to have job growth in the city for this city to continue to be the number one city in the city city of New York, uh, in this, uh, number one city in the country, sorry. Thank, great, thank you so much. I apologize for any background noise. My cat is Houdini and he escaped from his purgatory. But uh, Jay, I just wanna move over to you since you have such a great perspective um, on New York City politics. What, who is, how will who is elected the next mayor impact the city's recovery from your perspective? Well. <clears throat> it's a perspective. I don't know if it's a great perspective, uh, I mean, and I'll try not to be redundant of all the great things uh, Jim, James just said. Um, you know, I, and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll let his comments focus mostly on the mayor's race, but I'll pivot to the city council a little bit because we, uh, we're seeing, let's look at just what happened. There was two special elections two weeks ago in the Bronx, uh, in the Riverdale section of the Bronx, and, 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 and kind of like the Soundview area of the Bronx. Uh, the total vote totals for those elections, the leading candidate in one election got no more than a thousand votes. There wasn't one candidate that broke a thousand votes. And that, that person is going to be the next city council person. And the other race, um, there was, we were looking at almost a thousand dollars per vote spent. The turnouts mm -hmm. we're seeing are like below 5%. Uh, there uh, dismal amounts of people are deciding who's going to dictate policies on behalf of millions of people. And the city council has an outsized influence on zoning, on, on uh, and, uh, you know, fiscal policies. Uh, we, we often look at the mayorship as, you know, uh, and certainly this past mayor has shown what happens when a mayor kind of abdicates their responsibility as far as directing the financial well-being of the city and, and the direction the city goes as far as building more housing. Um, but the city council um, is extremely important. And, I, and, you know, and to echo James's point, it's very important that folks focus on their local city council races and make sure they're turning out to vote and voting for candidates who are looking at a pro-growth, uh, balancing those pro-growth policies with the what's best for their neighborhoods and, and for the betterment of the city as a whole. But we have to focus on kind of a balance, right? This idea that social, that there can't be a, a balance between what's good for real estate and what's good for New York City. Well, we know that what's good for real estate can be good for New York City. It just has to be done in congruency. And right now, two sides aren't talking to each other. There's this idea that real estate, whatever's good for real estate is automatically bad for social policies. That's nonsense. I mean, to Paul's point earlier in this seminar, where do the taxes, for these programs come from. We know that the average rent check for a rent stabilized property, 60% of it goes out the door before the landlord even sees it because it's going to property taxes, water and sewer. So those maintenance costs are fixed. So every time we rent an apartment unit, it is a benefit to the city. And every time uh, James and Paul rent a commercial unit, it is a benefit to this city. So the benefit of real estate is a benefit to this city. And once that congruency is lined up with city council candidates, candidates and mayoral candidates. So look for those candidates who are echoing uh, a kind of a echo system that will benefit both real estate and the, better, the greater good of this city. Because if we don't have the housing for people to work here and to live here, to, to James's point, in the middle class, lower middle class, and, and the workers of the city have nowhere to live, then it's pointless to, to, to spend money on social programs because we'll have no population to benefit from them. 
One thing I want to point out that's different in this election, which will make a real impact, is basically ranked choice voting. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, you don't just vote for the one candidate that you like. You get to vote for the top five candidates you like. And a, a, and a candidate can't win an election unless they get at least 50 percent of the vote. And that introduces an incredibly new dynamic into the upcoming elections. Uh, and it also makes it so a candidate who who hasn't won can actually win. So a candidate who doesn't have the highest vote total initially can actually wind up winning. So it's really critical, again, to focus on who the candidates are and understand their positions. And I see there's a lot of comments here about who do we think is best for real estate. And I look at it not just who's best for real estate, but who's best for New York. Um, I did a, a, a Zoom in our last, last night for a candidate that I really like, Sean Donovan, who, uh, and I like Ray McGuire, but you know, Sean's got a lot of experience and I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but quite frankly, I think you need to start paying attention to, to people like him because he's substantive, he's experienced. Um, and you know, if he can win, I think he would be very good for New York. Great. Thank you. Um, let's switch back to a more commercial lens. We've been talking a lot about apartments. Um, to James and Paul, what are commercial and retail tenants looking for right now and how can landlords and the lenders be more responsive to their needs? Paul, you want to go Jim's first? Good. Go ahead. No, nah, you're, you're good for that one, Jim. All right. So what we're seeing in the market, and again, you know, we have 60 brokers who are out there every day, you know, working with office tenants and retail tenants. And so we have a pretty good um, feel for the market. And we're also uh, active, not just in Manhattan, but really in, in four boroughs. We don't really do that much in Staten Island. Um, and what we've seen really in the last two months is a real shift in the attitude of tenants out there looking for space. And what we're seeing is a real uptick in interest now in making commitments to rent space. I think um, smart retailers and office tenants are beginning to see the opportunity here uh, to, to achieve really good long-term leases with their landlords. And what are tenants looking for? I mean, obviously the economics of the deal is really important in terms of the rent, but the other important thing is the quality of the space. Um, are they gonna feel safe in this space in terms of COVID? Is the landlord taking proper precautions? Um, how much, how much will they have to spend to get into the space? So for retailers right now, a lot of them are very eagerly looking at space that has been vacated and it has already been built. Uh, and this is very true for restaurant tenants. We're seeing a tremendous increase in activity from restaurant tours who are looking for you know, existing uh, built space. So they don't have to go in and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars building it. They can move in pretty quickly. Um, we're also seeing tenants now on the office side that are willing to enter into longer term leases. In the beginning of COVID, businesses were very concerned about what the future was going to look like, and they weren't willing to, 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 to enter into longer term leases. They didn't know to what extent employees would be returning back to work, or what the working from home um, movement would, would do to their business. And what we're seeing now is office tenants are recognizing that this is a good opportunity. It's a, it's a very good market for tenants, and it's time to go out and lock up longer term leases. Um, what do we think is going to happen with with rents in the long term? We think the rents aren't going up anytime soon. Uh, it might be another year or two before that starts to happen. Uh, one thing that I do think is going to happen with, rec with, 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 with respect to retail is when the, when the moratorium on being able to enforce actions against tenants, uh, retail tenants expires uh, and landlords start really going after their tenants for unpaid rent, that a number of tenants are going to basically give up their space. So there might be a wave of new vacancies uh, that come on the market, at least on the retail side, uh, when the moratorium is lifted. And that may also happen with the office, but I think it's more likely to happen with, with uh, retail. But it will present opportunities for tenants. So the smart tenants with some capital or investor behind them, this is an excellent market for them now to be uh, diving into. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we're seeing that trend too. You know, a few years ago, we saw tenant, retail tenants really looking for the five to 10 year lease terms. And even prior to the pandemic, retail tenants were really only looking for the short term leases so they could pivot and move into new space if they outgrew or their retail strategy changed. So 
I think yeah, it is we're seeing retail tenants are asking for maybe a year or two of percentage rent. You know, let us yeah. get up and going and let's see what we can do. We don't really know what it's going to look like. Um, so give us percentage rent for a couple of years. The one area where we're not seeing any growth right now is really, you know, the commercial business district, you know, Midtown Manhattan, uh, you know, because people haven't come back to the offices yet. So that's really impacted that market. But when you go out to the residential neighborhoods, you go out to the outer boroughs, we're seeing, you know, much more strength in the market. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree that it's very important that we all get back into offices just to keep you know, the midtown economy going ahead. Uh, so Paul, we have time for one last question. Um, could you give your opinions on what kind of leadership characteristics are needed for the rest of the pandemic and looking ahead? Um, I, I, I love Jim's call to action um, about paying attention to what's happening really tomorrow. I mean, the June elections are, are going are gonna to decide the future of the city. And I think, um, you know, we'll be our country if New York isn't the financial or one of the financial capitals of the world. So um, I think we should, we should end the apathy that exists um, in terms of voting and really, really not make the same mistake that we've made, um, for the, especially for the last two mayoral terms where um, apathy allowed um, a, a, a huge leadership gap. And the city needs strong leadership. It, it has, um, you know, we have to have a symbiotic relationship between the city and business and the city and uh, our education system. We've, we've got a million kids in our public school system who are the future of this city. I think they're being radically, in a lot of cases, underserved. Um, so we need to create a workforce, um, an educated workforce, so that we're an attractive city. I think, you know, Jim mentioned um, the Amazon fiasco. What, what did Amazon do? They walked away from a significant commitment where they were um, offering the city a lot of incentives to allow them to create their campus. And they, they just walked away and they executed probably even more uh, commercial leases a, as, a con as a conventional tenant um, around the city in different places uh, without having to offer the city any of uh, the concessions that they were giving uh, in Long Island City. So they, they must be just looking at us like, you know, what what was the city leadership thinking? So I think um, it, it's time for us to really think about what is that leader of the city and what are those leaders of the city and city council look like and what do we want them to be? I think we had strong leadership for 20 years uh, prior to this um, with Mayor Giuliani and Mayor Bloomberg, different people, different leadership style, but we need a, 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 a strong figure like that now. Okay, I think we're about out of time. Um, Anthony, do you, I just saw you popped on. Um, did you wanna say anything? I just wanna say thank you, Rachel. You did a fantastic <laughs> job. I wanna thank all of our panelists. Um, this concludes our first uh, webinar. We do have our second webinar coming up at 1030 with Michael Stoller working in a family business. So once again, guys, there will be a thank you letter going out to every attendee that was on live, as well as the ones that were un, um, unable to register and see it live. Uh, and continue your questions as well. We will be sending out some information to everybody. And, uh, and I wanna thank everybody. And also an edited video will go out to everyone within two, uh, give us about three days uh, to send that out to everybody. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Jay, Michael, James, Paul, Janelle, Rachel, Eileen, um, thank you so much. And this concludes our first panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.